Hello. Hi everyone, um, welcome to the session, Digitizing Community Collections. Before I begin, I'd like to discuss the logistics of this meeting. Uh, first, all attendees are being muted and video is turned off in order pre to prevent background noise and save bandwidth. Second, the chat box is also turned off for this webinar, so please use the Q&A box to submit questions and comments to the presenters. If you're having technical difficulties, please reach out to Stephanie Bricking or Betsy Hedler for assistance. And I will put that information in the chat box. Um, so uh, for the meeting on Twitter, please use the hashtag uh, SOAAM20. And this session is being recorded and a link will be sent to all SOA members after the meeting. Um, and now I'd like to introduce our panel for this session. Um, Angelo O'Neill is the Manager of Local History and Genealogy at the Columbus Metropolitan Library, where she works to promote and provide access to Central Ohio's history. Notable grant projects include the Ohio Digital Hub, Ohio DPLA Planning Grant, and a Lyricist Grant to Create Upload It. Prior to CNL, Angela was the Director of Collection Services at the Ohio History Connection, where she was part of the team that developed Ohio memory and established Ohio's Chronologizing America project. She is a board member of Ohio Humanities and previously served as president of the Society of Ohio Archivists, receiving the Award of Merit in 2012. Angela has a bachelor's degree in history and cultural anthropology and a master's of library and information science, all from Kent State University. She is a 2009 graduate of the History Leadership Institute and part of the 2016 Leadership Columbus class. Erin O'Donovan is a special collection supervisor at the Columbus Metropolitan Library. He manages the local history collection at the library, as well as managing the My History Project that provides digital images of Ohio and the city of Columbus to the world. He has presented at many conferences throughout the years, including the Community Webs Program at the Internet Archive, the Best Practices Exchange, the Ohio Library Council, and the Society of Ohio Archivists. He also has appeared numerous times on the PBS affiliate WOSU Columbus Neighborhood Series as a digitization and local history expert. Erin has a bachelor's degree in sociology from The Ohio State University and a master's of library and information science from Kent State University. Cindy Lindsay is a librarian of local history and genealogy at the Columbus Metropolitan Library. Cindy has recently begun working at CML. Uh, before accepting her position there, she was a local history librarian at Bexley Public Library for five years, originating their digital history collection and serving as a liaison to the Bexley Historical Society. Cindy has a bachelor's degree in history from Miami University and a master's of library and information science from Kent State. Nicole Sutton is a librarian in the local history and genealogy um, division at Columbus Metropolitan Library. Sutton holds uh, undergraduate degrees in marketing and interpersonal communications and graduate degrees in entrepreneurship and library and information studies. She's taught speech as an adjunct instructor at the University of Central Oklahoma. Her library experience spans academic archives and academic and public libraries. Um, and now I will turn the session over to our panelists. Right. 
do you have a slide, Betsy, before I go on? No, those were the, sli the, 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 the slides slide. with the technical details were mine. Uh -huh. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for that great introduction as well. Um, let's get my screen share started here. <clears throat> um, it's great to see such a big crowd. Not that I can actually see you, but great to know that you're there um, for a virtual SOA meeting. Now, this is not doing what it did before for me. Uh oh. We just tested this and it was beautiful. Go to a uh, setup slideshow. Working. Go to setup slideshow at the top on the top gray toolbar. Yep. Click set up slideshow. And then what? I'm on presenter view. Okay, go um, in the gray bar, there's a button that says set up slideshow. You want to click that. In PowerPoint or in? Um, in PowerPoint. Okay, that's where I am. So let's do present by an individual. Well, can you all see my screen? Yep. Because I can make this work. <laughs> all yep. right. It's different than what I saw before, but I can make it work. So we'll roll with it. All right. So um, we are going to talk today about digitizing community collections. Um, we're going to tag team this a little bit. So everyone on our team has um, a chance to um, talk a little bit and tell you about what we do. We had originally planned this session as um, a very interactive session where we were going to put everyone at a table and have lots of discussion. Um, that was before March happened and the world changed. So we've um, revamped it a little bit to give you a little more um, um, just sort of upfront information. And that, but I'm still hoping that we'll have plenty of time for questions at the end. Um, I'm a strong believer in learning from each other. I know that um, we don't have all the answers and I love when we have um, a session where we can actually um, learn from you as well. So um, we're going to do a little bit. Um, I'm going to start us off. Cindy is going to give you some examples of digital community collections um, that we have used as models and that are out there already. Nicole's going to talk about our My Upload project to introduce that. That's a grant funded project from Lyricist that we're actually doing beta testing on right now. And then Aaron's going to get into the weeds a little bit with some of the metadata challenges because we found that to be the biggest challenge with that project. And then we're looking forward to your questions. Um, so let's step back and talk a little bit about community collections um, and what we're talking about here so we can all be on the same page. Um, for those of you who have, who have been in archives for a long time, the idea of community collections, I think, is about as old as collecting. Um, even before digitization, we had people, um, um, customers or patrons, however, you, whatever your terminology is there, come into our, our archives and want to share materials with us, but not necessarily donate them. So um, any of you who have um, copies of prints, um, that was the old way of doing this, <laughs> or any of you who are still struggling with the old terminology of permanent loan, which we know is, a, is not an and that does not exist, but um, was, the, was a way that people did this sort of thing for a long time. Um, we're very lucky today that we have the ability to, um, uh, um, to use digitization as a tool for community collections. And this is really a great opportunity to make items from private collections accessible to the public and to um, our researchers in particular. Um, we know that there are some wonderful materials out there that um, are really important for research use and just for the world to know that they exist. So um, it's a great opportunity when an when a, um, individual would like to bring those items in, but they're not ready to donate to be able to digitize them and make them available. A lot of the, um, the examples you're going to see today were built in response um, to a particular crisis um, to be able to do community collecting as something um, as, a, as a large event happens, like the um, COVID-19 epidemic or the um, Black Lives Matter protests that are happening 
right now. Um, and that's certainly um, a great model, and we're going to talk with you about that today. Um, we also use um, community collections just as a way to do our everyday collecting. Um, we um, have started, so well, we started many, many years ago um, with the African American collection. Some of you have heard about um, through the, which we have funding, had funding through the Ohio Humanities. Um, group on that to be able to um, collect materials from um, individuals in the African American community in Columbus and digitize them and make them accessible. Um, we went about that in such a way that we wanted to really be sure that we were collecting what our community wanted to preserve, not just what we thought we wanted to preserve. Um, we developed an advisory group there of community members to be able to um, help us find materials and be able to help us so create selection criteria for that project um, and really make that a true community collecting opportunity. Um, I think you'll see in some of the examples that we're going to show you today that um, one of the one of the great opportunities, I think, with community collections is that opportunity, is that chance to really see what people in your community feel is important. Um, we spend a lot of time as archivists developing selection criteria and trying to figure out what will be historically significant in the future. Um, but it's always nice to have that check from the public to see if we're on the same page. So we will go with that. Um, we have done um, community collections at CML um, in a, up until relatively recently, up until April actually. Um, it's very much a manual process. Um, we, we still do hold scanning, well, before COVID-19, we held scanning days. I'm assuming that we'll do that again at some point, um, where we would take a scanner out um, to, uh, to a festival or a meeting and be able to digitize things that, that um, people would bring in for us. Um, it was a very manual process. We had a paper form. Um, you'll see that um, there, and Erin's going to talk with you about that a little bit later as well. Um, we've evolved that process um, to think about all digital user uploads. Um, even while we were doing community collections in this way, we, found, we would always have someone who would come up to us and say, I have all this stuff digitized already. Can I just send you a CD? Um, but a CD is great, but there's no metadata with it, and how do we capture <laughs> everything we need, and what are the scanning specs, and all of those things. Um, so we, we kind of struggled with that, and that was really our, um, our um, sort of driving force for doing the, the Lyricist um, upload project that you'll hear about as well, just trying to automate this process and make it as easy as possible for folks to be able to contribute materials to the library's collection. Hey Angela, can I jump yeah. in for just a second? Um, yeah. You're still seeing your title slide. Should we be oh, still no. seeing the title should, slide? I should have gone through, I would have went through four slides already. Um, so I had a thing where it said, um, OHC wants to take over my screen and I said yes. So clearly that didn't um, work, right? Hmm. Let, me, let me close let's this go. out. Yeah, let's, let's, yeah, have you reached there and share your slides again. Yeah, yeah. Do and then we'll just go through them. They were really just um, pick fun pictures anyway. So let's, believe it or not, we practiced this. We and did. It's going beautifully. <laughs> I think when you share your screen, you may get two choices for PowerPoint, one of which is the, is the presentation and one of which is the, the view we were seeing. So it's, that can be. You want I to wonder, share that? You want to share the application and not your screen. Yeah. Oh, I'm not getting that choice. Hmm. Can you see it now? Nope. No. Why did this work? Let me try it again one more time with feeling. All right. So, you know what? I think my Extra monitor is causing a problem too. Let's see. Um, let's try that so we don't hold us up. Um, Aaron, do you have, I sent you the PowerPoint. Do you want to try it on your screen? Since my screen is kind of flaking out. Sure, let me uh, 
Let me pull it up. Because now I'm not even getting the right screen share. I'm going to try this one more time while Aaron's pulling it up. Can you see us? Can you see yep, my screen? It's there now. You're yep, good. Gotcha now. Can you see a second screen? Yes. All right. Yeah, you're good. <laughs> All right. We'll just stick with it then. How's that? All right. I'm going to turn my second monitor so it doesn't look like I'm looking at the side all the time. All right. Sorry for the technical difficulties. We'll get through this. So um, let me just catch up on slides real quick, and then I'm going to turn it over. Um, this is the African American Collection homepage. I talked about that a little bit. Um, you can find that at columbuslibrary.org slash myhistory. Um, this is us doing scanning days and our beautiful form there. Um, and now we're going to do a poll. Technical difficulties are not going to happen for this poll, I'm sure. We'll figure this out. So I'm going to turn it over to Matt to do that. So what I would like to know is what is your organization's experience with community collections? Are there a lot of folks doing this right now? Um, are you doing it, uh, do you not accept community collections at all? Do you only do in-person community collections or electronic or both in-person and electronic? And I'm using electronic because sometimes people have an email process where someone can just email you something. So we're, we'll, we'll count that as well. So it looks like 51% um, of you are already doing this, both in person and online community collections. That's fantastic. Um, looks like about 27% already do not or are, are not doing community collections. Um, so hopefully um, you all will um, learn something today and that'll help you make your choices there. Um, and only 2% are doing um, online only. So that's an interesting um, thing to know as well, and still quite a few doing in person only. Um, what, what I hope you'll see as we talk about um, my upload more, and I mentioned that, that we're currently doing beta testing with my upload, um, that some of you may be able to adopt that to help you move from in person collecting only to the, the online tool as well. So good to know where we all are there. So I'm going to turn it over to Cindy now, who's going to give us um, an overview of some of the digital community collecting initiatives that are out there. And then we'll talk more about more, my upload. So Cindy. Hi, everybody. Uh, it's great to see you today. <laughs> um, yeah, so I just want to, I'll talk about a couple of examples of community collections that we looked at while we were developing my upload um, and some that have come out since the COVID-19 um, pandemic has started. Um, so there's, in looking at this, there's kind of two types. There, there's ones that are created specifically in response to an event in the community or the world. Um, and so we'll look at a couple of those. And there's others that are just used as a community scrapbook. Um, and so we'll look at, at one of those as well. Um, next slide, please. I don't know a better way to, to do that. Okay, so Sorry, um, that's okay. Um, so the first one and the, the biggest uh, example really that we looked at was the University of Virginia. They created a, uh, an archive, a digital archive in response to the Unite the Right, right rally um, and the community response to the rally uh, that happened on August 11th and August 12th of 2017. Um, while it was going on, library staff captured uh, social media posts and news articles digitally, um, but they knew they wanted to reach out to the community to get other items that they could add to a digital, to a digital collection. Um, so three weeks later, they launched a tool uh, using Omeka 
Um, and they have, uh, ever since that, they have been accepting uh, donate, um, material from the community to put into the, their digital collection. Um, this was their first time collecting material so close to the actual event. Uh, and they have built, from, from what they learned from that, they have built a digital collecting toolkit um, using a grant uh, or grant funds. Um, next. Uh, in 2011, the Peace Corps, uh, another example we looked at was in 2011, the Peace Corps uh, celebrated their 50th anniversary and they asked volunteer, former volunteers and uh, returned Peace Corps volunteers. I'm still not clear on what the difference between those two are. Um, and they put those into a digital, digital archive along with their own material such as newsletters and speeches and annual reports. Uh, they did this just by using an online submission form. Um, and then a public library we looked at was the Deep Plains uh, Library in Deep Plains, Illinois. Um, they have, uh, on their website, they have Deep Plains Me Memory and they started my Deep Plains Memory in, in 2014. Um, and after five years of collecting, there were two, there's 218 items uh, within the collection. Uh, and they use uh, their community partners and small businesses to, uh, they reached out to them to get material for the archive. Uh, one example in this, in this photo, um, this photo was actually submitted because the, um, the person who had the photo's grandfather is the police officer uh, in the photo. Um, but of course, the man in the car is John F. Kennedy, uh, John F. Kennedy um, and he actually started his campaign for president in De Plains, Illinois. Um, and so that's a picture from, from that event. So you never know uh, what you might find. I, I know we find um, pictures of people that we don't, we don't necessarily ex expect to be in Columbus um, and, and photos that we get all the time. Go ahead. Okay. Um, and so uh, there's a couple, there's many people doing COVID-19 specific projects now. Um, two that uh, I looked at, or that we looked at, um, Ball State University, they reached out to all existing partnerships, um, Everyday Life in Middletown, and then the Muncie Public Library. Um, they wanted to, they really wanted to know how, their big question was how they can, how can they get people to start documenting? Um, and so they reached out to these community partners to get a, a wider net. They put a questionnaire out through Everyday Life in Middletown to make it easier for people to document their experiences. Um, and they believe that a digital community archive uh, creates community stakeholders. Um, and the Atlanta History Center really wanted to ask people the question, how is this affecting your life? Um, and so they get uh, personal reflections, photographs, video and audio, as well as student, student video journals. Um, and they're uh, very interested in collecting physical items after social distancing, distancing is over and we're able to um, all be together again. And of course, we were already, um, we had already created my upload. We were, were testing it before COVID-19 happened. Um, but it really has, uh, launching it during COVID-19 has really changed our, our outlook on it. And we have gotten a lot of COVID-19 specific material uh, within the time we've had it up. Uh, the the top, photo, top right photo was actually the first photo we got. And it's a photo of an elementary school um, saying they're closed. And then the um, a, a yard sign for an election or for an issue on an election that was delayed, of course. Um, and now I'll turn it over to Nicole. Thank you, Cindy. Can everyone hear me? All right, great. Um, so as Cindy just discussed, uh, there are several or organizations who have found ways to collect materials from their users. And as we saw from the poll, uh, poll at least 50% of you are doing that already. So that's wonderful to see. But often these methods aren't uh, achievable for organizations who lack the staff, the funding, or other resources. So 
At Columbus Metropolitan Library, we wanted to create an orp open source online tool for ourselves and other organizations like libraries, archives, museums to collect community contributed materials. And that's why we came up with my upload. And we actually submitted this idea to the 2019 Lyricist Catalyst Fund Award Program uh, that provides funding to, as their website says, test, uh, refine, collaborate on innovations with potential for community-wide impact. And we were actually chosen as one of the, the recipients for 2019. And that's how our idea has become a reality. And as Cindy just showed you, we've already started to collect some co community contributed materials. And now we're just gonna talk about some of the benefits and the features of my upload, and then go into how it can be used at other organizations and potentially your organization. So first off, we have the user-friendly language. We wanted to make sure that we weren't using a lot of library jargon that might be hard for users to understand. And anytime we did feel like maybe we were using a term that might not be as common as we think it is, we tried to put a short description afterwards. So like after we put metadata, we put in parentheses, author, description, rights, and we do that throughout the form. There is individual or bulk upload. So uh, users can put just one image in and put their metadata in for that one image, or they can put multiple images in, images, audio, video, um, and then they can either choose to put one metadata form for all of, the meta all of the media that they've uploaded, or they can choose to create individual media. So if they have uh, multiple photos taken at the same event on the same day by the same person of the same subject, they, they might just want to use that single form for all of them. So they have just the one metadata form, but if they have multiples, they can fill those out individually as well. The next is the user submitted rights information. So rather that being on us to try to figure out what the rights information is, uh, we have the user specifically choose one of four options, open to everyone, non-commercial use only, no reuse submitted, or to say that they just simply don't have the copyright. So that streamlines that process. Um, and that's part of how it streamlines the process for staff. We're not having to try to connect a paper form with an online object. We're not having to try to come up with the bulk of the, the metadata, and we're not trying to figure out the, the right statements on our own. So that really helps on the staff end of things. And then it's open source. So we specifically wanted to create this tool so that it was open source and could be used with any digital collection software. So we use ContentDM, but whether you use ContentDM, Omeka, Islandora, any software, you can use my upload as well. So next, I kind of want to get into what it looks like on the user's end of things and then what it looks like on the staff end of things. So starting with the user experience, uh, this image here is actually what the users see when they first go to uh, my upload. And there's a little description under each image that tells you the steps one through three, but I've kind of condensed that down into these three words for the purposes of the presentation to just upload, describe, and submit. Um, so the first thing, once they hit uh, get started from this screen, it's going to take them to a screen where on the left they can upload their media and on the right they give us some basic information. So we ask for contact information and then they do a CAPTCHA. So they just check the little box and say, I'm not a robot. <laughs> and then on the left, they can either click the box to start browsing for files on their computer or they can just drag and drop files there. And again, that's either an individual file or they can do a bulk upload. Then once they uh, submit the uh, media, then they can go ahead and describe the media. So obviously for us, we're trying to get the metadata, but we just try to use more simple terms so that it's not as intimidating as create the metadata. <laughs> um, and at that point, that's when we go ahead and we ask for them to create a title, give us the original date, original location, the author or creator for the material, a brief description, and then how they would like us to give credit and the copyright information. Again, they just have the four options and they just choose one of those. And then there, the last step is a checkbox for use that just says, I authorize Columbus Metropolitan Library to use these images in their digital collection. And then they submit for approval. So once they've submitted for approval, then it comes to us and that's where the staff experience starts. So on the back end, we view the media, we review it to to see if we're going to approve or reject the media. Obviously, in most cases, we're going to be able to approve it. And then after that, 
uh, we can then export the metadata to be used with our digital collection software and download the media. I've been purposefully a little vague on the staff experience because I'm now going to pass it off to Aaron O'Donovan and he's going to tell you more about that. Great, hey, everyone hear me? Great. Um, so creating uh, metadata and community collections used to be a, a bit of a task because what we used to do is uh, just hand somebody a form and forms just really scared people. <laughs> it was like handing somebody a pamphlet and like, and you're trying to sell them something. That's like the best way I could describe how that works <laughs> for, for us in the past. Um, and that generally led to a lack of interest or confusion because the number of fields that we had on our form, I think just here, you can see just on the front page here, I think there's about 10 and that's not even the entire form. So that sort of was, was a barrier for us. Um, and what that led to was incomplete metadata due to time constraints because the form was so long or lack of clarity because we we're using um, library and type of terms. As you can see here, author, creator, slash uh, publisher is all on one line, and that's confusing even to librarians, let alone just a regular person. Common problems that we had with metadata, um, dates were sometimes incorrect or vague. Um, the person did not, didn't know a lot about it, or they just would write 1950s, for instance, for, for an image that they had. So that led us to a lot more work on the back end, which was, was not um, desirable for us. Uh, addresses usually were not included. Again, a big part of what we do in community collections is, is making sure that we capture neighborhoods and addresses because we have a mapping feature and people really love searching their address or their neighborhood specifically. Um, so having that out on the, not having that on the paper form was, was really um, not a great thing for us. And creator was surprisingly confusing. People confuse that with the, for instance, if someone took a picture of an elementary school, they would say the Columbus City Schools is the creator, not the creator of the actual photograph. So we just wanted to know who they were or who, the, who took the photograph. And surprisingly, that sometimes was confusing. And most of all, copyright scares people, um, especially when you have unlimited options. When you say copyright, people just usually like run the other way. So we wanted to make it as simple as possible on the digital, um, on the, the digital, um, integration that we have with my upload. Uh, this is actually a picture that I took. So um, as an example of what the form looks like up close. Um, so we just decided to simplify everything. We dropped it down to just very few fields. I think we have six fields on here that you can fill out and then one checkbox. Um, and what we found is this works a lot easier. Address and city impossible, like giving them that even in that note really helps them actually put in the address. Um, the original date, they, they tend to write it in the form that we want. If not, we can just always fix it. Um, and then description and author are very easy and understandable. Easy form with boxes. So again, permissions, four choices, and a checkbox. Very easy to submit. And what we found out is making copyright and make, making metadata less scary is giving us better metadata because of that. And so we're actually getting better metadata because we're simplifying the language. So to put it simply, what we found out was the boxes are good for the online form. Forms are bad. So this is actually a picture of, of my cat on the left. The picture on the right is not my cat, but it looks a lot like an, another cat that I have, which is in the background of my that one on the left. So it's amazing how simplified a box and a form may sound like they're very similar, but they're not at all once you get to the actual application of it from the user experience side. And what we found out was that humans aren't that much different than cats. They like boxes a lot. Paper, not so much. They tend to this, like a cat, kind of look at it on the table, either sit on it or kind of throw it away. <laughs> like cats do, <laughs> knock it off the table. And um, that's kind of what we found. It was uh, forms that just, paper forms, like it was just uh, an aversion to that naturally for, for whatever reason. Um, and I think it's just a sheer amount of information on there. It's kind of overwhelming for people. So you can just simplify it, make it check boxes, make it quick little pithy, boxes they can get through, user experience is nice and easy. We got a lot better results. So our experience, this is what we found out, better metadata with fewer fields and simple language. Um, most users really cared about nouns. So 
proper uh, places like the name of a school or name of a neighborhood, a name of a person. Librarians care about all of that in the metadata. We care about every field, but I would urge you not to let the perfect be the enemy of the good. If you make your metadata form or metadata boxes in our case too complicated, people's eyes tend to glaze over and we tend not to get good um, information from them because either they're, they don't understand it or they're not gonna fill out the box. They're just gonna leave a blank. Um, so we can add and edit the metadata fields on the ingest process. So we're gonna just do that. So we're gonna just give them a basic set they can fill out and we'll fill out everything else that we already know. Um, we, can, we can do that um, in an automated process. It's not a big deal for us um, with, with the spreadsheet being exported. So customers tend to lose interest or overwhelmed after about three minutes. Generally what we found um, when we're giving them a form um, tend they, they need to be helped out after three minutes of going through the form. Um, so that's why our online submissions about three minutes to actually submit something. Um, don't over, and I would say don't overcomplicate something for your own reasons. As librarians, we want to make sure we have 50 fields of metadata because we want to get every last bit of metadata. But to be honest, that's overkill and customers don't really need that much or want to put that much information down. So what we have here is a screenshot of the basic fields that we take down and how simplified and, and small it is. That's it. Questions? There we go. Um, all right, one thing I wanna add before, if we could, before we do questions um, is uh, to talk a little bit about when, when Aaron was talking about the right statements and the metadata in general, um, I, I know you said this, but I just wanna reiterate it, that we simplified the material on the form, but we still have, we still use our normal Dublin Core metadata on the back end, and the right statements in particular still connect to, uh, um, um, to writestatements.org. We just didn't use that exact language because we thought it was going to be a challenge for most customers. It's a challenge for some of us as librarians to be able to figure out write statements sometimes. Um, so we tried to really just simplify it and think about what would be the easiest things for people using this tool um, to be able to just quickly select rather than um, use our language. So let's see. We have do you want me to do questions, Rachel, or do you want to do that? I can keep going. Hey. I'm here. Yeah, I'll do that. <laughs> yeah. um, just wanted to time my appearance at the right moment. Um, okay, I'll open up the Q&A. You have a couple of questions in there. The first question is from Barb Sedlock. She asks, um, some of your listeners are not affiliated with public libraries and do not accept contributions from the local community as part of their mandate. And, and I think that's absolutely fine. Um, and we're defining community as whatever your, um, in public libraries, we, we use service area. So you, but your community may be your, your campus, your college campus. It may be your department, it may be the, the company that you are the corporate archivist for. So however you define your community, um, that's what we're talking about here as well. So we use that term pretty broadly. Okay, so the next question is from Sarah Eisenberry and they asked, um, when you ask users to upload, do you ask for materials from specific events, for example, COVID-19, or do people just upload what they, anything they want? That's a great question. Um, so we launched this in um, April. And so at that point, we were really pushing it as COVID-19 materials. Um, we've since kind of switched that into, um, um, into documenting some of the social movements that have happened, but it stays up online as my upload all the time. So um, we've had about 150 photos mostly submitted so far. Um, they've ranged from everything from specific COVID-19 materials to, to, the, to the specific protest materials, but we've also had people submit old photos of the Ohio Penitentiary, 
which is always a popular topic, um, a few different um, parks and old buildings and places like that as well. So we're kind of doing a mixture of all of that right now, but um, it's really up to you to decide if you want to just use community collections for specific um, events or make it for everyday uploads. Okay, and the last question I see in the Q&A box um, is from an anonymous attendee and they want to know, does my upload take all file formats? Not quite all, but we've tried to hit the major ones. So, Erin, um, you might need to help me out with this because I'm not looking at it. I don't have it in front of me. Um, so, it'll take JPEG, TIFF, PDF, um, MP4, what else? I think Word Docs. Word Docs. Yeah. I think there's a couple others, but we do have to... I know um, just enough about code to be dangerous, but I know that we have to profile each file format in the code, so it's not completely open. Um, I think the only one we are not taking right now is maybe GIF. Yes, or we GIF, however decide, you want to pronounce it. We did yeah. decide not to because we felt that anything that would be uploaded um, as a GIF was probably not going to be of sufficient file resolution for us to be able to keep anyway. So. Um, we didn't. We're also, um, we're in the beta tests right now of this, so we're looking at what other file formats we may need to add before we go officially live with it, um, which will be around July. So if you have, if you want to advocate for something, please let us know. Okay, so we have a couple more questions. Sure. Um, this uh, anonymous attendee asks, um, I'm sorry if the presenters mentioned this and I missed it, but where can I access the tool? And maybe you just kind of said not yet. Yeah, not yet is the answer, <laughs> but soon. Um, so right now we're testing. If you would like to do a test of that, we're in our final week of testing. So let me know today. Um, you can email um, history at columbuslibrary.org. It's the easiest way to get in touch with us. Um, so we're in the test right now, and then we're going to go back and do another about two to three weeks of development work on the tool and really work out um, any of the bugs that we found, work through those file formats, that sort of thing. And then we're looking at a mid-July launch. Um, the code will be available on GitHub. There'll also be a white paper. Um, uh, written by our team here that gives you all the information on how to implement it, um, as well as some um, tips for things like marketing and promotion um, and just sort of some general best practices for community collections. So that will go out, um, I can promise you, on the SOA listserv and the Ohio Dig listserv. Um, so stay tuned to those um, tools, those lists, and you'll, you'll see that come through as well. And I think um, ultimately the code will be um, shared on GitHub and mm -hmm. you guys will be able to edit the code as you would like after it's released. Right. So even if you want it, so that even if you are, the fields that you would choose for your basic metadata are not ours, you will have access to the code to be able to edit those and make them your own. Okay, so we have a few more questions, but I think we have plenty of time. Um, Rachel Brock wants to know, and I think you can pretty much just mention this first part of her question, um, is my upload a free tool for libraries to use? And after the collections are uploaded, are they separated into searchable collections? It is a free tool. We developed it specifically as open source, so anyone will be able to use it. Um, I think, I think I'm gonna give Aaron the second part of that question. Sure. I think yeah, so, better than me. Sure, yeah. <laughs> uh, it's, a, it's a great question. Yeah. Um, we have uh, a general, a general collection, collection called Columbus Memory. Um, and what we've done to identify the My Upload versus all the other stuff in, in the Columbus Memory is have a separate collection field called the My, Up, My Upload collection. So we can search just by the My Upload feature um, my upload um, keywords and you'll get just those results. So um, that's what we ultimately decided to do because the the stuff we're getting is so different from each other. So what we want to do is put it into our main collection where most people access our information, but we are able to 
to show people that it's working and to show, um, to be able to count how much stuff we're getting for grants and other purposes, just to see how successful a tool it is to be able to count those by doing that search and putting it into a separate um, digital digital collection, quote unquote, by by um, tagging with metadata. So um, that's why we know we have over 100 already. And I would think depending on how your digital collections are set up, if you wanted to put items in multiple collections, you'd probably have to do some manipulation on the spreadsheet for that. Yeah, it wouldn't be and hard to do. Set up. I mean, it's yeah, possible, it's, but. Yeah, it wouldn't be hard to do at all either way. Um, it's just we're just going with this route and it's just a nice clean way of doing it. Okay, um, so if you're ready for the next question, um, uh, Anonymous asks, my supervisors wanted all kinds of personal data about users on the forums, such as date and place of birth, uh, purpose being metadata. I was able to limit that to three fields and make them optional, not required. What do you think about asking people this type of information? I agree with you and prefer simplicity. I can answer that one if you want, Angela. Um, so we do ask some personal information. We ask mostly for contact information and who took the photo and who submitted it. So we ask for the, who the loaner is, the person who took the picture is usually the same person, but not always. And then we ask for their contact information. Um, but when we actually put it online, I actually delete those fields. So it's only for um, in-house use only, just for tracking purposes. So if something's wrong or if we need to contact somebody about their image, we can contact them. And it's a way of, kind of like our old paper form of, of tracking who's donating or loaning information to us. Um, but we don't put that information online. So I just, um, when I up, go to upload it from the um, Excel spreadsheet that's exported, I just delete those particular fields when, uh, when it comes to the upload process. And I think we're, um, there may be a, I think there's a policy question there that you have to really think about what your organization does. Um, our, our organization isn't, um, w well, um, from an early, early decision about community collections, we decided that we weren't going to be the go between, between connecting, um, a, a, a different user who wants to use the image to the person who submitted the image. So we, once we know that the image is acceptable and we're going to take it, all that we really need is the name of the person that submitted it, but we're not keeping any information to try to connect people. If that's what you're thinking, um, that's maybe where that question is coming from. Um, also, if, if you're thinking about um, personal information, um, I always like to take the approach that we only collect the personal information that we plan to use. Um, and if you don't have a very specific reason for why you're collecting that personal information, I wouldn't collect it. So that would be my advice. I would also note they also have the option if the loaner does not want to be named, they can put anonymous in that field. That's fine with us. Okay, so uh, the next question is from anonymous and they ask, do you accept objects and paper-based materials or just digital? Um, sure. Um, people can still bring materials in, well, theoretically, if we were open, people can still bring materials into the library and we would still scan them um, on demand. Um, we do still accept items for donations as well, um, of course. Um, donations certainly have a much higher bar than items that are scanned for the digital collection. Um, with um, space and time for processing being at a premium. Um, it really has to be something that we know um, is historically significant and we wanna keep forever to make that list. Um, but we will continue to accept um, paper-based for us. We don't do objects because we're a public library, but if, you know, if you're a museum, you should, that, that, would be, <laughs> that would be appropriate, of course, as well. I think you, what we're trying to really do is get to what is easiest for the individual and how do we get people to engage with our, our archives um, as much as possible and make the process as open and simple as we can. And so for us, 
that's meant um, this digital option, but there will always likely be people who want to bring in that item and show it to you and sit down and, and have it be scanned. So we're, we're still going to do that too. Okay. Um, so where am I in the questions? Okay. Um, Heidi Cates wants to know MP4 and not MP3. I can take that. Uh, we take MP3 yeah. as well. It's just MP4. It's just the, the simple video format right now. But yeah, we take audio as well. So it's pretty um, file agnostic. Sorry, I misspoke there. Good question, Heidi. Okay. Um, the next question is from Jen Johnson. And they ask, do you have a system on the back end to apply content or context or sorry, context warnings or labels? And they also commented, uh, also, neat project. Thanks, Jen. Um, we do not do content or context warnings. Um, we haven't done that in the past, and it's just not part of our process at this point. Um, okay. So, no, we don't. But I would imagine if you wanted to do that, um, you could add a field into um, the spreadsheet before you do your upload and add those in at that stage or upload and then add them in once you get into your digital collection software. We also do have a spot to um, reject media for whatever reason. If, um, I don't know, say someone, say it's a bot or someone. Or totally uh, inappropriate. Totally inappropriate <laughs> stuff, that kind of stuff. So we, we look at it first before it gets published. So um, we, so we do have a, a little bit of a um, process that it goes through before we would put it online. Okay, uh, the last question that I currently see is from Anonymous, and they ask, this may be getting a bit off the main presentation topic, but can you talk about your preservation strategy slash workflow for the community content that is submitted? Sure, um, I'll start that out in, and maybe others can fill in for me. So. Um, the short story on that is that um, our community collections go through the same digital preservation process as everything else in our collections. So Aaron mentioned that um, we add these to our Columbus memory collection. If you're a content DM user, you know that you've got multiple collections and um, Columbus memory is sort of our catch-all. Um, within that, they're listed as my uploads so that we're able to query them and all of that sort of thing. But um, in general, we use OCLC's Digital Preservation Archive. So when materials get um, uploaded through my upload, they go through that same um, digital archive process as everything else that we upload. So we don't separate it out and make any distinctions. You want to add anything, Aaron, or anyone? I was going to say, at this current time, being that we're working from home, everything is going to an external drive and so they can get into the preservation <laughs> archive. Right. So, um, right. so that's what we're doing with the items right now. And they also stay in the queue for a while on, on the back end because we do have some server space for the, the metadata and the images. But um, what we're seeing right now is mostly people are sending stuff through um, JPEG and they're usually taking them from their iPhones. And I think they're uploading them right from their iPhones. So that's the other thing I think we forgot to mention that this is, um, uh, uh, a, a workflow that will work for people just on iPhones or tablets, smaller devices. I also works just as well as, as a computer. So uh, I've been, that's where I uploaded a picture from of that crawfish. It's just, uh, <laughs> so my phone and I can just take it directly from my phone and it's a very easy process. So it's the other thing I think advantage is that we can um, sort of remove a, a, a layer of technology there. Okay, thank you. It uh, doesn't look like there are any other questions at this time. I want to thank the presenters today. I personally learned a lot and probably have a lot of follow-up questions later. Um, uh, just a reminder that uh, when you close out this session, you'll be prompted to complete a survey um, uh, about this session. And the next session will be at 12.30, and it is uh, sharing the initial steps on a digital preservation policy. 
Thanks, everyone.